everybody, and welcome to Books Unbound, the podcast where we unbind books to get to their hearts with your hosts, us. It's Ariel and Raylene. Hello. I feel like it's been so long, but it doesn't seem like it's been that long for everyone watching, but it's been two weeks since we saw each other. (laughs) It's been two weeks since we recorded, but also the last month of episodes has been really bizarre because we pre- we basically recorded three in one week, right? Yeah, while we were together, we slowly came out. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's just been kind of like the schedule. This is one of the very few reliable things in my life that we record <laughs> on Mondays and episodes come out on Mondays. Yes. Like it's like very regular. Yeah. And the last month has been chaos. Yeah. Chaos. It feels like kind of like, you know, when we, how we talked about when you go like on a trip and we feel like yeah. we're far away from each other for some reason, yeah. like we feel more distance. I feel like we've been on like, a, both of us have been on a weird vacation i agree all this like i feel like i don't know everything's where we are (laughs) i don't know what's going on but quite frankly i know that we're back even though we haven't actually been gone (laughs) it feels good to be back it's also funny because i feel like we haven't done like a reading update in forever like nobody knows what i'm about to say you know like nobody knows (laughs) what i'm doing here with all these books (laughs) nobody knows what the hell's going on but yeah so basically today we're gonna be basically going back to a normal bog standard episode Mm -hmm. we're gonna be talking about what we've been reading but it is a little bit jazzed up just because we have so many book reviews to do. So we're going to really be leaning on the book reviews on this episode yeah. because we have been gone spottily on and off for a couple weeks here. Um, I mean, the episode that came out week before last was kind of an update one, right? It was a quarterly like, update. It was a quarterly update. So we did talk. We caught up with you guys <laughs> in some capacity, but it was like... You still oh, don't man, know what I nuts. read four weeks ago. Like I, I exactly <laughs> the books I'm going to talk about exactly. are like I'm taking it back to a long time ago. <laughs> Bring it back. Bring it back now. How yeah. uh, how's the last week or two been though? Do you have any updates for a, us? And the a people? little. Yeah, I mean, yeah. so last week we were off um, because of all the pre-recording, but also because it was Thanksgiving here in Canada. Yes. So it was nice to yes. have that day off. Usually we work every stat holiday because they're all on Mondays um yeah so it was kind of nice to just have that day off so I went and hung out with my family like we had like the whole day of just like cooking and I was crocheting and like having a good time so like that was really nice it was nice, it was nice to have that day um to really be able to enjoy it start to finish so that was one thing but then this past weekend, I did what Julia and I do every October, which is go to Indigo for a little shopping trip. Oh, yeah. We started doing this like three or four years ago where there's no like set date, but sometime in October, the two of us will jump in a car together and drive out to the nearest Indigo, which is a bit of a drive. So it's like a special trip that we do. Mm-hmm. And we always go. And we get a little Starbucks, get a little pumpkin spice latte and shop. Cute. And we just kind of like... You know, we're not in a rush. We just spend, you know, a good hour and a half just looking around. And yeah. so we did that and it was really fun. And um, I bought a couple of things. So I do have a little bit of a book haul. I also bought a candle, which I don't have here right now, but I got this little Ooh. apple scented candle. Ooh. Apple cedar was the scent. Very nice. But something weird I noticed when we went to Indigo mm. this time is it was October 18th, I think, the day we went. There okay. was like no Halloween stuff left in the store. Everything They're already over it. is Christmas. I couldn't believe it. That's I wanted crazy. to get a pu- it is crazy. I wanted to get a candle that's shaped like a pumpkin because I've seen them yeah. online. I know that they exist in Indigo's database. And so I was hoping to find one, but they've all been replaced by Christmas already. So I just got this dinky little apple scented yeah. candle. I was good. Okay, it's funny that you go onto that tangent because when you said that you got an apple candle, I was like, I have a question. Do you think that that's more of a Christmas <laughs> scent or a? I mean, it is harvest, right? It does feel yeah. like harvesty. So it, it was is part of a their fall scent. But yeah, it feels they had more a Christmas tiny so. display that was like fall-ish. So there was like pump. They had some pumpkin candles, like pumpkin scented. They had apple. They had like a cinnamon one and a vanilla mm. one. And then maybe one other that was kind of like some kind of tree, you know, which could go either way. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, they really, really are leaning into Christmas now. So that That's was a little really... disappointing, honestly. Yeah, that is a little disappointing. Because we go in October for the fall vibes. Right, no, exactly. <laughs> so now you're like, do we have to go October 1st? August 31st, I think perhaps? we might have to like, go in August, like... honestly. I think yeah. that's where we're at because I have started, I've been seeing Christmas stuff in stores for a while now. But it's really taking That's over. so, I, I kind of, like, I get it. Because basically a similar thing happened to me. We went to the liquor store oh, yeah. a couple of, well, I was going to say a couple of weeks ago. It was a week ago. <laughs> it was a week ago that we went to the liquor store. Yeah. 
And in September, they had a big display of pumpkin flavored drinks like pumpkin yeah. beer and pumpkin cider right. oh i remember and that. i saw that <laughs> yeah yeah and so we were like let's buy some like that's really cute i ne- i then had other friends coming last weekend and i was like oh we should go to the liquor store because i like having drinks when people are here to offer everyone um and i was like we could buy some of those pumpkin ones yeah and because it's thanksgiving right. right this was like the day or before thanksgiving or something and so we go into the liquor store and I couldn't find them anywhere. And I asked the lady, I was like, do you have any more of the pumpkin stuff available? And she's like, isn't that crazy? We <laughs> don't have any left. She's like, we only have this one. There was one oh. beer left and it was in the free, like in a, in a small fridge. She's yeah. like, this is it. We're going to sell out today. And then the rest of October, we won't have any. That's I was like, crazy. really? She's like, she's like, yeah, because we order our Halloween-ish stuff. Yeah. In the beginning of September, or maybe she said like end of August, I forget, but she said like we order it months ago. Yeah. And now everyone in the whole province and the country has ordered it. So there's none left. Right. So whatever we order then, we can't reorder. We can't buy more of it. So once it sells out, it's gone. And she's like, bring out the the peppermint schnapps. (laughs) Yeah. She's like, so we start with the Christmas stuff as soon as we sell it at the Halloween stuff. And I was like, I guess that makes sense that yeah. you order it months ago. So if you sell out fast, you do. But yeah, for but some reason fall. with a bookstore, it feels like a targeted attack at me. Like it's like <laughs> no more fall. It's Christmas. It feels more yeah. purposeful for some reason. Um, mm. But anyway, like I said, I did buy a couple of books there as well. And hilariously enough, the first book is kind of a Christmas mm. book. <laughs> oh. And that is Small Things Like These by Claire Keegan. Mm. so Mm. this is one that's been on my radar since we did our like end of the year episodes from last year because so many people said that this was their favorite book of the whole year and i'm assuming a lot of people had read it like at christmas time so it had probably just happened and so i feel like this book like really took over um for a lot of people's reading and it apparently uh it was shortlisted for the Booker Prize in 2022. That's on the cover. Um, and I don't really know much about this. All I know is that it's like a Christmassy story set in a small hmm. Irish town in 1985. And it's Christmassy. And it's very, it's a and tiny little making, book. And they're making the Killian Murphy movie? Oh, are they? I feel like maybe. Am, is this the that. right one? May, I, it might be. Maybe. It might be Let a look different this up. one. Claire Keegan's kind of Killian... blowing up right now. I think it, it could be a different book of hers, but it might be this one interesting let's see killian small things like yeah, these. that's this 2024 that's coming out oh in my a couple months good golly i better read this but i don't yeah, have enough room some... in my reading to read a different book hmm. what when shall i do it just oh november 8th that's very soon <laughs> <laughs> really i watched what? the trailer it looks really sad yeah well yeah that's the it, it yeah. does look like a sad little book sad little christmas book. i like how little it is i know i all the books i got are very skinny but this mm. one is very very tiny as well um but i also picked up two other books so i went into this trip as i always often do with these october trips with like no expectations of what i want to buy i'm like i'm just gonna see yeah. where the wind takes me i would pick mm. things up and then find something else and go no i don't want that one anymore and i would like you know so i had like a stack at the beginning that it totally changed and so right near the end i realized I hadn't looked for um, Banana Yoshimoto in a while in a bookstore. And so I was like, let's just see what they have. And so they didn't have a ton. They had Kitchen, which I already have. And then this one, The Premonition, which is by Banana Yoshimoto, translated by Asa Yonada. And this one, it came out in Japan in 1988, but it was only released in English here, like, I think a couple years ago. I feel like this one just came out. Very recently, at 2023 oh. is when the, the English translation is copyrighted. So mm. it feels new, but it's not even new. Um, so this one seems really cool. It's about like a young woman who's 19 and she goes to live with like an aunt, I think, in in some other place. And it's kind of just like about them, you know, learning to live with each other. And like the aunt is kind of weird. She like watches Friday the 13th over and over again. It's her comfort movie Ooh, for some reason. Okay. So I'm like, oh, yeah. it feels kind of like it's giving me a spooky vibe for for right now but yeah it yeah. seems kind of like a like low key spooky a little bit um premonition yeah so i don't know much about it but i really have enjoyed both um banana yoshimoto books i've read so far so i just have been trying to collect her but i haven't been able to find any so i took a chance on that one and then the final book cool. was one that i have been hoping to find for a while but i just haven't seen it in a store and it's hmm. one 
that was inspired by Ariel, and that is Ooh. The English Understand Wool by Helen DeWitt. <laughs> so good. I've been thinking about rereading that one. Really? Well, yeah. It's yeah. I think you mentioned this too when you first read it or hauled it, but what it says on the back is uh, Storybook ND is the name of this series of books. And it says the pleasure yeah. of reading a great book from cover to cover in an afternoon. Um, yeah. Which I think, is that how you read this? Did you read it all in one sitting when you first read it? God, I think I did. I don't want to lie. I bet you there's someone who remembers my reading better than I do now. I really remember either doing it in one or two sittings, yeah, like but it was like It's that. very it short. Very like short. it's only 60, I think 69 pages. And like some yeah. of the pages have very little text on them too. So yeah, I mean, buddy read. Do we smell a buddy read in our future? We always Ooh, say that. Like a, I think that it could have really we, happen. <laughs> have we done one before where it's like, one person's rereading and the other person's reading so. for the first time. No, I don't think so either. And we, I don't think we've ever done a buddy read in one sitting with like something that wasn't a graphic novel. Uh, but this one, we could easily sit down for a couple hours and read it, right? So Totally, yeah. Anyway, this is one... I don't know anything about the plot of this because I remember when you read it, you were like, go in blind. Like anyone who yes, reads this, like yes. you didn't really tell us much about it. So I don't know much no. about it, but I've been wanting to get it ever since you recommended it. And I know a lot of people who listen to the pod have also read it and loved it. And so I yeah. saw it and was like, <gasps> I almost bought a different book in this series because they had one there that was just another book in the series by another Japanese author that I like. And so I was like, oh, do I buy that one? Or do I buy the one that I already know I want? And so I decided to go with that. But yeah, so that was my little that's tough. indigo haul. It's all very small, my little skinny Cute. books. But yeah. That sounds fun. Yeah, it was it was lots of fun. So do you have a Starbucks in your indigo? Oh, yeah. Okay. Big time. None of the, like, I remember growing up in Ontario, a lot of the chapters would have starbucks oh yeah but then slowly they all started to close and oh. none i haven't been to a chapters that has a starbucks in like a decade i want like it's been forever oh, really so i'm jealous that you still have coffee in your star in your yeah in your i mean chapters. i think I, I wonder if it has something to do with like the chapters versus indigo thing because i feel like every indigo um, i've been to has a starbucks inside and i don't really know what's going on with chapters anymore because okay. there's not that many of them yeah. left yeah no no but yeah, I'm glad that it is in there because yeah. I, I needed it. I needed it. Cool. Yeah. Oh, well, well, that sounds great. It was great. I do have one more update and then we can throw oh. to you. It's not like super exciting, but people. I have had a couple of people ask about this, so I may as well share an update. So Kyle and I have started painting our house again <laughs> because Whoa. last year... In the summertime, I think it was, we like painted our living room and the fireplace. And like, I talked about it a bunch back then when it happened. And then we've kind of just like stopped <laughs> ever since yeah. then. But I've been wanting to tackle the rest of the house because like our bedroom is a really ugly color. The bathroom still has that purple paint that I, uh, you know, love to talk about. <laughs> the trim, the trim around the house in the hallways, it's purple. Um, so I really have been wanting to fix that. And so this weekend we spent all of Saturday doing that we like painted the whole dining room area we painted half of the kitchen uh turns out it's a lot trickier to paint a kitchen than i thought it was going to be because there's lots of yeah. nooks and crannies and oh, yeah. cupboards and stuff uh, oh, but yeah. so it was a little annoying but it was fun and i'm happy to have done it but because of that now my books are all in our bedroom because we had to Ooh, move my books and so we moved the books a few days ago and i was like i kind of like this this is kind of nice. Yeah, that's cozy. It feels like I'm being hugged when I'm in my bedroom uh, now, you know, like, because my books are all, nice. they're all around me and everywhere I look, <laughs> there's books. <laughs> so how did you logistically, how did you do it? Like, did you remove all the books and put them on the bed, then move the shelves in and then put the books back It was on actually the a very perfect system. So okay. we have a table, like a dining room table yeah. out there right next to where my books are. So what I would yes. do is I would grab half of a shelf of books, put it in a pile grab the second half of the shelf, put it in a pile next to it. And I took all of okay. them off just of one bookcase. Then we yes. would move the bookcase and then yes. shuffle those those books, books over. And nice, tidy. I yeah. Like that. And then I, what I started doing, that, that was the first one. The second time I was like, well, we can just move these stacks directly into our bedroom, put them on our like dresser so that it's a little bit closer right. to do the move. So that's what we did for the second and third bookcases. And it was very streamlined cool. and very easy. Kyle was amazed that it only took us like 20 minutes or something to move all the books over. Yeah. He was like, that was so fast. I thought that was going to take hours. Um, yeah. But yeah, so my books are a little crazy right now because I did put them all in the same order, but they're not like... 
they're all flopping around they don't look good sure, but i could sure. i could do that later but whatever so i i feel i feel cozy when i'm in my room now but the the dining room is just like a white a blank white space <laughs> so it's kind of scary in there oh, right now right yeah now that's gonna feel really empty <laughs> but yeah so um, next it'll be moving yeah. everything back so we can paint our bedroom so it's gonna be a whole thing oh uh, well maybe it'll only take 20 minutes i mean maybe you've perfected it maybe it'll only be 15 it, this it time. might take Shave a couple less, minutes off. even less <laughs> but yeah so i've had like a busy weekend but i feel i feel productive and happy <laughs> yeah i do have to ask what paint color you're using i mean the people are going to want to know if if you're going you're leaving you're you're erasing the light purple which i like if anyone's watching the video version of this they're like <laughs> oh my god ariel is light purple behind her how insulting but it's like you're i know why you don't like that light purple it's kind of pinky and gray it's, and yeah if i had not... chosen it it would have been a different purple and yeah. like also what i love about your house is that your house is quirky like everything about it is just kind of like each room has a, like a theme kind of and it's cool sure, yeah my house is just like a big kind of like donut almost and so everything is connected and so if one room right. is one color and then the next one is not like it looks awkward and weird and so like everything is just being painted the same color which is so boring but whatever oh, that's okay. it's fine it's that's okay. what is it like is a nice for. white yeah it's, it's, like a it's clean... kind of like yeah. it's, it's funny i actually thought it was white we went to order more of the paint we called up the paint store and we're like can we get some more of that white and they were like you've never ordered white paint from us before and we were like oh my god what and um <laughs> <laughs> it turns out it's light gray uh it's just okay. a very very light gray so it looks yeah, white. yeah. <laughs> but that's so yeah funny. so we're just we're painting everywhere we got three different types of the same color so that we could paint the bathroom Ooh. we could paint the trim they're all yes. different you know, different gloss. It's it's yes. all very exciting. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so everything is just turning basically white. Um, but I think it'll look That'll really That'll feel crisp. really clean. Yeah. yeah really, really Our clean. Our bedroom right crisp. now is like brown. It's kind of like a medium uh, brown. So like it's very dark in there. So I'm excited to get to our room and like brighten up that space. Yeah. So nice. all in all, I'm feeling good. Feeling good. Is it stressful that you have the new carpets down? Yes, <laughs> that's a great question. <laughs> I am so paranoid. So Kyle and I both wear Crocs yeah. around the house. Like that's kind of our indoor shoe. And so I'm like, okay, we've put the tarp down. The Crocs are not allowed to touch the tarp. If you're stepping off of the tarp, right. you're putting your feet into Crocs in case you've stepped on right. paint by accident. And yes. so like that, that was, and there was one moment where Kyle was like, uh oh, I accidentally wore my Croc onto the tarp. And so we were like, <laughs> being very sure that there was no t no paint anywhere and yeah it's been very paranoid but we have yeah been that's so i mean far. that's stressful because you can't clean carpet no no like if i spill um paint onto my hardwood floors i can wipe it off yes like i can, I can and i had that like happen scary. in the kitchen a lot i right. dropped so much paint in the kitchen which was quite funny it was all over the countertops luckily you can just like chip it off it's totally fine yeah it's it was okay carpet, but it's really scary <laughs> yeah that's scary so we have two massive tarps scary. that like covered basically the entire living room so it's cool. like cool okay. it was safe nice but nice folding up the tarp was scary too it's like don't drip <laughs> don't make a mess so yeah that's that is a little scary yeah so we've we've finished one zone and we're ready to move on to there's like two more zones of carpet left that we okay. have to paint Oof, uh. that's that's good though that's good because you've been meaning to do this for a while so i know it'll feel so good when you're done it feels good i'm really happy so it's good. gorgeous well what do i have to say about my life um happy thanksgiving i wrote down here <laughs> happy thanksgiving everyone happy turkey day <laughs> So yeah, it was Thanksgiving for us on last Monday, like you said. Mm -hmm. um, I had a really nice time. I kind of feel like I had two Thanksgivings Ooh. because our friend invited us the weekend before to kind of, his parents were visiting from out of town. So they decided to do a Thanksgiving. And I was like, I wonder what I could contribute to this meal. I was like, I know cranberry sauce. I'll make cranberry sauce. Cause I really like cranberry sauce. And it is, it's interesting because it's not a traditional part of my family Thanksgiving. Oh, interesting. Like my dad always made, because in Honduras where my mom is from, there is no such thing as Thanksgiving. Yeah. And so Thanksgiving was just my dad's thing. And my dad doesn't like cranberry sauce. So he <laughs> never made it. it. Growing yeah. up, I never had that. And But I would see it in movies. And I was like, <laughs> that seems cool. Yeah. I want to I want to try that. And so I remember one year I bought some like in a can. Yeah, it's easy or something. to get. And I tried it and I was like, oh, I really like this. This is nice. Mm -hmm. And then I was like, I'm going to try to make it. And so over the years, I, I, I feel like I'm making something that is like from outside of my own culture. Yeah. Which I guess it is part of my own culture. <laughs> like I'm Canadian, yeah. but like, I just feel like, what is this magical <laughs> sauce? It's so delicious. I love that. Um, but yeah, so I've been like 
experimenting with recipes here and there over the years. And like literally like last year, I just forgot to make it. Mm. I was like, oh, I forgot that I care about that. And then I just didn't make it. But this year I was like, I'm going to make it. Yes. So for um, our friend's Thanksgiving, I made cranberry sauce and I also ended up making a salad. And the cranberry sauce is insane. Like it was so <laughs> good. Oh, good. Uh, the, I just found literally a random recipe online and I was like, I wanted to have orange and ginger in it. Ooh, like, I feel like that's good. Spicy. And so I typed in orange ginger cranberry sauce. Mm -hmm. And a recipe came up that was called easy orange ginger <laughs> cranberry sauce. I was like, that's okay, the one. We're winning. So I just followed that. Very simple. Well, actually, that's a lie. It wasn't that simple. <laughs> it's like, it said it was easy, but you had to zest. And Ooh, the second that zesting, zesting comes into it, I don't think that it's simple anymore. No, like, I agree with that. You need a specialized tool. I don't think it's simple anymore. Yeah. But I still did it. Um, so, you know, you zest two oranges, get the juice of the oranges, and uh, you have some grated ginger in there. And oh, and cinnamon sticks. I mean, it's just unbelievable. It was so, so good. And so then the next week I had actual Thanksgiving here at home and we had friends come visit, which was so, so nice. And um, I made the, the cranberry sauce again. Oh my God. And you can make it twice. Yeah. <laughs> so I just really feel like I got to know this cranberry sauce over the last couple of weeks because I keep making it. Yeah. And I'm like, I'm going to make it again for Christmas. Damn it. I can keep making it. Yeah. I mean, um, it works. So I had a very cranberry saucy time. <laughs> like I mentioned, I had my friend visit. That was such a beautiful visit. It was my friend Jacqueline and uh, she listens to the podcast. So hello, beautiful Jacqueline. Oh, it was a really sweet visit. She was so, she was such a great guest and she brought her partner, which was really nice. And um, I sent you photos of this, Raylene, but she wanted to look at the stock for the truck. Mm -hmm. She was like, I want to have like a, basically like a private Beset Books event. And I was <laughs> like, I'm obsessed with this. This is awesome. <laughs> so we went through all of my boxes of stock and pulled out any that kind of interested her. And then we put them all on the dining room table. And then she just like sat there for ages and went through and looked at all of the different books and it was really really fun because so i was nice. like trying to sell her on books and um yeah and she bought a bunch of merch and everything <laughs> and actually i want to <laughs> i want to state this for the record she's my number one client of the year <laughs> she spent the most money on the truck that anyone has ever spent so she jacqueline is she my wins. number one customer <laughs> yeah she won i remember when i i was at my first event there was a person that spent over a hundred dollars and that had not happened yeah um because it was my first event and it was like on the second day or something and she spent a hundred dollars and i was like this is insane like i can't believe and i gave her a tote bag right yeah um, so i was just i was like taken away i couldn't believe it um so it's just really special when someone like spends a lot of money on your on your shop. Totally. You just feel like thank you, thank you. And <laughs> it was it was really fun. So that was great. My other update that I have written down is that I passed 50 books read this year. <gasps> Yay. At some point. Woo! <laughs> at some point in the last couple of weeks. I passed 50 books. If you guys recall, I was, had set up a reward system oh, that was yeah. like, if I passed 25 books, I got to buy a pair of shoes. I bought the shoes, loved the shoes. <laughs> uh, I wore the shoes to my birthday party, actually. You, oh, yeah. Those are the shoes, shoes that I wore. The great shoes. Great shoes. And then I was like, okay, well, if I pass 50, I'm going to buy myself a pair of my favorite pants, trousers for my British Ooh. friends. And um, I did that. And it's really funny how I... I like that I really respect it because I was at like 49 books for a while or something. Yeah. And I was like, I could just buy the, like, I'm going to pass it. Like I can just buy the pants. And I was like, <laughs> no, I cannot. <laughs> I have not passed the mark. I do not get the pants. Okay. Yeah. So I finally did pass the mark and I was like, it's happening. And I went and I bought myself these pants. So they're on their way now Ooh, and I'm very okay. excited to get them. I'm excited to see them. They're the exact same as the black and white ones that Connor got me for my birthday. Yeah. They're from Big Bud Press, but they're brown. And I'm really enjoying brown. I'm lately. glad you so went I'm for looking the brown. Forward I remember to there the was brown. some debate over which pants you should get. You showed me a lot there of was, pants. And I there remember was a lot saying of brown. I remember I remember something Ooh. about brown pants. So You see? There you go. You made there the right it choice. is. <laughs> I'm excited about the brown pants. So now if I pass 75 books, what should I get? I don't know yet. You don't know I yet. Haven't. Ooh. I haven't made a decision on what that could be. Are you trying to make a full outfit? Maybe you buy yourself a really <laughs> nice sweater. <laughs> That's such a cute idea. I never thought <laughs> the about- The final item could be a little chapeau. <laughs> <laughs> a tie-dye 
tiny little hat. Oh, you know what? That's a really cool idea. I have had my eye, and actually not on a specific one, but I've really wanted a massive scarf. <gasps> Ooh. So that's what it'll be. I think that's perfect. I'm just going to find the scarf of my dreams. Yeah. And that will be what I get if I get 75. That's and like, beautiful. if I reach, I really think that I will reach 75. I'm yeah, scared about the 100, right? But I yeah. do think 75 will happen. Yeah. So if it happens this year, it would happen like in November or December. Mm -hmm. And then I would buy the scarf and I would have it for winter. So this is great timing for a scarf. Yeah. Okay. So Good job, everyone. Read your heart out so that you aren't cold this fall. <laughs> This exactly <laughs> and, and and just to add to that i'm not allowed to use any scarves until no i'm just i'm just kidding i live in canada and i need that yes, yes. <laughs> um yeah so those are my little updates i literally just wrote happy thanksgiving i made cranberry sauce <laughs> past 50 books so i bought my pants those well, are I'm, my updates I, that was those were good updates though I, i'm glad to know about the pants <laughs> Whew, well shall we start reviewing some books then let's do it oh Right. I have chosen out five books to review. Raylene has four books to review. Mm -hmm. So we're going to go back and forth on this thing. And I am going to start, I think it was, yes, a book that I bought with you while <gasps> you were here. Whoa. And it is One Week in January by Carson Ellis. Carson Ellis is the author and illustrator of best-selling picture books, books for children, including The Wildwood Chronicles, and has won awards for illustration, including being nominated by the Grammys for album art design. She lives on a farm in Oregon. One Week in January chronicles a week in 2001 and was published in 2024. I remember I found this book when I was with you and we were shopping mm -hmm. in Lunenburg. Yeah. And I never heard of this one, but I just thought it looked really beautiful. And I love the concept of it. And so the concept of this book is that Carson Ellis found a little diary she had kept for one week in 2001, in January in 2001, when she moved to Portland. Hmm. And basically, she had kind of started to recognize that she was having some memory problems. Oh. And that she was feeling this, like, existential anxiety about forgetting her life. And so she thought, I'm going to keep a diary. I'm going to mm. write down everything that happens to me for this big week in my life. I think she's like... I'm trying to remember now. I think she was like 23 or something yeah. like that. Tw Young, 20, 25. Move. Here it is. Yeah. Age of 25. Maybe I'll read you here, actually. Um, I had begun to fret about forgetting things at the age of 25 and that this obsessive record had been a brain exercise to stave off memory loss. Her hmm. friend reminded her. She's like, I found this diary, but I don't remember it. And oh. which is kind of the yeah. spooky part that like she's funny. right she didn't remember keeping this diary and she talked to a friend from the time and she's like yeah do you remember like you were scared of losing your memory and so you kept this diary for the first week of moving to portland and so in that way it actually worked she says the week i moved to portland would be sinking slowly into oblivion if not for this meticulous journal that brought it all back hmm. and so she finds this journal she rereads it and she yeah, she decides that it would be cool to illustrate it. And I think it's such, such a beautiful project. So, and I, I like this too. She says, I'm not especially proud of the impression I make in this journal. I cringe at my twee turns of phrase and my casual mentions of Hemingway and Soviet art films, <laughs> but I've made a point not to edit much. I love this 25 year old me and I'm not mad at her for trying too hard. And she goes on from there. And it's a really, first of all, the art is just so stunning. It does remind me a bit of Myra Kalman. I was just thinking who's, that. <laughs> yeah, as an artist I really love. Um, but it's literally just a week. It's very short. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a couple pages for each day. And she does really write down every day, like, what happened. Like, every little minutia. Yeah. She's like, I woke up. I go down. I went downstairs. I ate a bagel. I saw this person there. We talked about this. We decided to go for a walk. On the walk, we ran into this person. Hmm. So it's like literally the whole yeah. little chronicle of every day. Um, and then she just pulls out little moments from those days to illustrate with these full page illustrations. Cool. 
The illustrations are stunning. And the diary, while not particularly significant in the objective sense where you're not like, this is the week she discovered nuclear fusion. <laughs> right? Yeah, no, it's just no, any nothing old like, week. yeah, nothing crazy happened. And it's also not like a personally objective significant week where it's not like, this is the week where I got pregnant or the week where mm -hmm. I got engaged. It's not like a monumental week, but it kind of is really significant and beautiful in just capturing a moment in time of mm -hmm. like, this person who's just starting out to be an artist and wants to be an artist and has moved in with some friends in like a warehouse in Port Portland. And it's like only a 20 year old would do the kind of thing. And yeah. um, looking back and reflecting and there's a lot of characters as well that she talks about become very important hmm. in her life. Like she, her husband is in it, but he's not, they're not even dating right. at this point. Oh, that's cool. He's dating someone else. And so it's just like, there's like a whole web of people that I kind of didn't understand, but I kind of liked that because I was like, yeah, yeah you're looking in on these, someone's life. Like she knows who peak. these people are. You don't yes. have to necessarily understand who they all are. Exactly. That's really interesting. Exactly. That's cool. It was really interesting. And so I don't give it a five out of five. Like it's not a new favorite thing because it didn't, it kind of didn't feel very complete. It didn't have much of a narrative, mm -hmm. um, which is tough. Like with a letter or with diaries, like they're not supposed to be a narrative. They're not supposed to feel complete. It's yeah. not supposed to be a beginning, middle, and end. You're telling like a thing. But sometimes you have like with 84 Charing Cross Road, a correspondence that works beautifully mm -hmm. as a beginning, middle, and end. Or maybe like with Anne Frank's diaries, you have these diaries that are very significant at capturing an important yeah. historical moment. And so it's like, you don't want to compare it to things like that. But you can have diaries that have a really big arc and have something really interesting happen in them. And this was a little bit meandering, but it felt very poetic in that way. So I liked it for what it was. Mm -hmm. It just didn't kind of knock over into the like new favorite book right. zone. Gotcha. Um, and I also would a hundred percent buy a print of one of these. Ooh, like, yeah. So beautiful. Awesome. Well, so that's cool go. that you read that book so fast after buying it too. Yeah. I always love that. Well, it was just so pretty. I was like, I want to know what that's about. <laughs> hmm. Okay, well, the first book that I wanted to review is one that I was reading and talked about on the podcast, you know, like a month ago. And so I figured okay. I should definitely review this because I finished it. Cool. It's been a while since I finished it, but uh, I'm going to finally review Only Ooh. Child by Rhiannon Navin. Rhiannon Navin grew up in Bremen, Germany, in a family of book crazy women. Her career in advertising brought her to New York City, where she worked for several large agencies before becoming a full-time mother and writer. She now lives outside of New York City with her husband, three children, two cats, and one dog. Only Child is her first novel. Yes, like I said, it's been a while since I finished this, so the memory isn't maybe the strongest, but I do remember how I felt about it. So mm. I remember talking about, I was at the beginning of the book, I think, when I last mentioned it, and I was talking about how sad it is, I think. Yeah. So that's the overarching theme of this book is like, it is very, very sad. Um, okay. So the story starts out with the main character, who is this six-year-old kid named Zach, and he is at school, and there is an active shooter at his school and he is right. hiding in a closet with his entire class and his teacher so that's how the story starts so it's very wow. very like traumatizing from the beginning and obviously the yeah. young main character like plays it plays into the whole thing and but that's just the beginning like it gets sadder because obviously there were casualties in in this oh, okay. and someone very close to zach was killed as well and so okay. that's a big part of the story and so it, the whole story is just tinged by sadness. That's obviously what the whole book is about. Um, and this one gets compared to Room quite a lot because of the young main character and like yeah. going through something traumatic. But my problem with this book is I didn't believe the main character as like a young, oh, you know, no. narrator. Like okay, with Room, yeah. I feel like jack feels so real like and he feels like oh. an actual kid and like the way he reacts to things and the way he like processes information feels very childlike whereas with yeah. this book i felt like uh zach weirdly enough his name is zach which is very similar to jack as well um but okay. zach is like he's always kind of just like listening in on adult conversations and like interpreting things in a way that like I feel like he understands more than he should be a little bit yeah and like the way that he describes things sometimes are weird like there's um kind of tension between his parents and he interprets that one time there's, there's a whole page of description where he's like the the house is like a thunderstorm and it's like like he's describing it in a way that I'm like would a kid think like that like I don't know yeah, <laughs> it's just a little weird tough. and it would like totally. take me out 
But yeah. that being said, I found I still found it to be an enjoyable book to read, like despite it being very, very sad and making me want to cry almost every single page. <laughs> like it is a good book. It just like there were things about it that kind of took me out. And I feel like it had lots of good, like interesting things to say, sort of like how, mm. um, you know, the kids that are the survivors are still important and still need to be looked after. And like, you know, people are kind of focusing on the people who were lost, which is obviously tragic, but they're kind of like leave, like forgetting a little bit about the people who still need to be cared for. And so that's kind yeah. of like a big theme with the book, which was really interesting. So I do feel like it had like good things to say and it was good in some ways but unfortunately it didn't end up being a favorite which is I really had like yeah. put it on a pedestal of like it could be a new Damn. favorite of the year so that could have been partly my fault but it, yeah it did but let still, me down a little bit unfortunately so this was such a mashed potato book for you and yeah I feel like when you finally tackle a mashed potato you want it to be amazing so it's like extra sad when it's not because you spent so much time building it up exactly and like for the first half of the book I was like yes this could be Maybe this will be a new, like, it could be a new favorite. And I was, yeah. like, really hoping that it would get there. And then it kind yeah. of, instead of, it kind of plateaued a little rather than, like, getting to that five-star zone. Yeah. So, oh, it was a little disappointing, but I am glad Darn. that I read it. So, there's a plus there. That's such a tough topic. I don't know if I can read a book about that topic. Yeah. That's, yeah. That's <laughs> it's brutal. really sad. You, really scary. Do you think that um, Brenna Thumler should read that? As she told us years ago, she's she the one loves who, a she's stressful the one who read, She read it and oh, and encouraged me to read it. That's where I think it came the, from. I think okay. the timeline is that I mentioned it on a book olds or something, and then Brenna read it and recommended it, and then I bought it, and it's been sitting on my shelf since then. Oh my God. So wait, 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 wait. <laughs> Is this an example of the Cat Dennings effect, but like really slow burn? Really, really slow. Yeah, I think you're right. And Babetta yeah. loved it too. So like it's so that worked it out worked fine. out. But yeah, I think yeah. it is the Cat Dennings effect for sure. That's so funny. <laughs> That's hilarious. All right. Well, before we move on, I'm I'm talking about five books. You're talking about four books. Did you overall like the stuff that you read, or overall didn't like? I would say overall like. Okay, okay. So this isn't uh, about to be like four books in a row oh, that you hated. No, that would suck. That would really <laughs> okay, suck. Okay, great. No, it, it, and it, it has this, it goes on some waves. There's some journeys that we're going to take in my reviews, but I did, like, I loved one, <laughs> cool. really liked one, sort of liked Only Child, and then kind of didn't like the last one. So it's like, Oh, okay. So you've got like a perfect little crescendo yeah. <laughs> there. That's funny. Um, all right. Well, the next book I'm going to talk about was one that you gave me, and it was Brownstone by Samuel Tear and Mar Julia. Samuel Tear is an author and was raised outside of St. Louis, Missouri, and now lives in Aurora, Colorado. Mar Julia is an illustrator and cartoonist from South Florida. Brownstone is their first collaboration and was published in 2024. All right, so this was a gift from you to me yeah. on my birthday, as you obviously know. <laughs> and um, I was so excited about this one that I was like, I just want to read it right away. Like, I know, I remember uh, you I like mean, putting it in your little backpack and bringing it to Halifax when we were getting ready to go on yeah, the plane. So I was yeah. like, oh, she's going to read it. I, yeah, I really, really wanted to just go ahead and read it because ever since you mentioned it to me, so basically, if people didn't hear that episode, Raylene linked me to this book a couple of months ago mm -hmm. and you're like look at this book that i found it looks amazing and i was like that literally looks amazing like i think i'm gonna buy it or something like that and you were like pretend i never linked this to you <laughs> and i was like oh yeah my birthday is in three weeks or something yeah. like got it and so i but ever since then i'm like i can't wait to read that yeah. so i read it and Mixed bag, Raylene. Mixed bag. I know, Classic. I know. And so it's not nothing to do with the with the gift. Obviously, it was a perfect choice. I would have bought this for myself as well. There, let's start with the good because mm. there's a lot of good here. First of all, the illustration style. Love what Mar Julia did here. I think it's so beautiful. They also had a really beautiful color palette Ooh. that just. It was a very rich book, very warm toned. So okay. it really felt That's like nice. the whole book was like set at sunrise and sunset Ooh. kind of a thing. Like it's just like yeah. really, really rich colors and everything. Um, and then story wise, I like the idea of it. I In some ways it felt kind of unrealistic. The setup is basically you have our main character whose name is Almudena and she has never met her dad. She's a mixed race and she's grown up her entire life with her mom and it's relevant to the situation. So her mom is white. And so she doesn't have any real attachment 
to her Guatemalan side of mm-hmm. her life. Um, but her mom gets this like exciting work opportunity and she's going to go away for two months, basically oh. exactly for the summer. And so her mom leaves her with her dad for those two months. Mm. And already I was like, that wouldn't happen. <laughs> like you would not leave someone like your child that you've raised for thir- for 15 years. Yeah. You wouldn't leave them with a strange man that neither of you have talked to for 50. Yeah, that's true. There's got to be someone else. <laughs> like there's got to be someone else in your life <laughs> that you trust. Anyone? Or you or you take the daughter with you, right? Like I was like there's a lot of better solutions than leaving her with a man that you haven't talked to in 15 years. Secondly, leaving her with a man in a fixer upper. Like the whole mm. pro- point of the book is that she spends the summer fixing up this building yeah and i loved those parts of the book because i found it super relatable i was like no kidding i've done that ripping down yeah. and this like i loved those sections of the book because i i found them really relatable but i also couldn't get it out of my head that i was like you would not thrust your daughter into this like why would why would you spend the <laughs> summer doing a, a summer of renovating a house but then I add on top of that, the third thing that didn't make any sense, which was that the daughter doesn't speak Spanish and the dad doesn't speak English. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, you would not leave someone who's the primary carer and they can't speak to the daughter. Like yeah. there was situations where I was like, this is <laughs> <laughs> like, it was, it was literally unsafe because she like started ripping down a wall and he was like stop stop and she's like i don't get it and he's like there's electricity in that wall like you could electrocute yourself and i'm like this is so dangerous i'm like what's going on like i couldn't get it out of my mind <laughs> like this is not but the right situ- <laughs> that the situation was just like slightly um not so it was just unrealistic and so i think actually similar to maybe your experience with only child mm. it's like even though you want to get into it this thing that's not working you can't stop you can't looking unsee at it. it yeah you can't unsee it um so putting that aside the thing that, that it, which did bother me because throughout the book i was like none of these things would be happening right but yeah putting that, that aside that makes sense the story is really beautiful because it's about this daughter who's getting to know her dad and like they they become friends and getting to know each other and getting to know each other through this hard work mm-hmm. which i think is really cool and, and like the bonding that can happen over a shared project is really interesting Um, And she really gets to know this community of Latinos and specifically Guatemalans, but there's also other um, Latinos there. And that's really cool because she's like, not even real, like there's this really sad moment in the book that made me really, it was very tragic where she's like very attached to, um, she mentions like the Day of the Dead and this other, I forget who it is, but some other like, um, it's not like the Mayans or the Aztecs, but it's one of those. And she's like, yeah, that's part of my culture. And everyone's like, that has nothing to do with you. Those are all Mexican things. You're not Mexican. Oh. And it's like very heartbreaking because yeah. you're like, oh my God, that's so sad that you think you're one thing, but you're actually yeah. like, I know that like a lot of people think of Latinos as one big thing, mm-hmm. but it's like, there's just so many different, like I have nothing to do with Mexican culture. I right. don't know anything really about it. It's yeah. a completely different thing. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so that was interesting. I like those themes, but... There was another thing that really bothered me, and I, again, couldn't get over it. Okay. <laughs> I couldn't get over the fact that people were really mean to her, oh. like really mean to her, for being mixed race. And everyone at the end of the book was just okay with that. Oh. <laughs> like, I kept thinking that there would be some form of conversation that was kind of about the two-sidedness of the situation. Mm-hmm. So it's k- kind of like... She needs to recognize that she is mixed race and that that comes with a certain, like, I don't know my own culture and this is very difficult and I want to be a part of it, but I'm also not fully a part of it. Like, what does that mean? That's complicated. Yeah. But I also thought the people that, like, were, like, fully Guatemalan would be like, yeah, you know, she is one of us. And even though she's mixed race, she is part of us as well. And, like, being Guatemalan can be lots of things and it can be being half Guatemalan. Literally at one point, and I mean, this is a slur, but like at one point, somebody, one of the Guatemalan characters calls her a half breed. And I was like, oh, wow, this is going to be like the pivotal moment of the text. Yeah. I saw this and I was like, I couldn't believe it. Like, I was like, this is insane that this, that this was just said out loud. Yeah. And then on the next page, she gets over it. And I was like, what? 
what? I was like, no, like that's like a literal slur that's been said towards you. Whoa. And she's like, oh well. And then throughout the entire book, they have this um, nickname that they call her. They call her off brand. Okay. Like she's an off brand yeah. version of a Guatemalan. And I was like, wow, that's so mean. Like, I mean, it's not like, it's not like a slur, but it's really mean. Yeah, it's moving and I that was way. Like, <laughs> yeah, I was like, they're surely gonna talk about that. <laughs> They do not talk about that. And so I was like, oh, I don't know. I just, it made me really sad that they were all really mean to her. And yeah. they're constantly pointing out the fact that she's a mixed race. But then nobody ever has a moment where they're like, actually, that was rude of us. Yeah, with this type of book, I feel like it has to have that, like, moment to, yeah. you know, show that none of that was okay. Like, <laughs> I know, I know. I just felt like I wanted a little turnaround on it. It would be different if these were adult characters, but they're teenage characters. Mm. Anyhow, there you go. I liked a lot of elements of it, but I also didn't like some elements of it. And I know that I'm being very picky because it's just a topic that's really close to me mm -hmm. and I'm like invested in. And I don't actually read mixed race characters very much where yeah. the point of the book is that they're mixed race. And so I was like, yeah, ah. of course you're going to pick it apart. Like you want it to be the perfect book about the topic yeah. and it just wasn't. Yeah. Which no, but I bad. still did enjoy it. And like, I, I am glad that it exists. It's a, it's a nice book mm -hmm. um, that's out there on this topic. I guess like, my question for you is, it does it feel like middle grade or does it feel more YA? Like, is it? What, it felt more middle grade. Okay. I was um, wondering if that was. But the character case. turns out to be 15. I thought she was 12 the entire time. <laughs> and then she has a King Sangera at the, at the end of it. And I was like, oh, she's 15. Whoa. <laughs> huh. So it turns out that it's. Yeah, it turns out that it's YA, but it felt like middle grade. Too. Yeah, that's what it was kind of sounding like to me. People yeah. bullying with no consequences. <laughs> Sounds very <laughs> middle grade. <laughs> uh, all right, there you have it. What was your next one? Well, my next one is a book that you mentioned earlier in the episode, and that is 84 Charing Cross Road by Helene Hamp. 84 Charing Cross Road was first published in 1970. It chronicles Hans' 20 years of correspondence with, with Frank Doel, the chief buyer for Marks & Co., a London bookshop. She depended on the bookshop and on Doel for the obscure classics and British literature titles that fueled her passion for self-education. She became intimately involved in the lives of the shop's staff, sending them food parcels during Britain's post-war shortages and sharing with them details of her life in Manhattan. This is one that like I read so long ago. I read it when I was on the plane to come visit you. So that was mm. almost an entire month ago at this point. But yeah. I, so the, the reason I read this is because I just brought my Kobo with me on the trip. I was like, I'm not right. going to bring any yes. books because I know I'm going to buy a lot of books, which as we yeah. know, I did. So I was like, I'm just going to bring my Kobo and I'll decide when I get on the plane, like what I'm going to read. And so we were just sitting at the airport. It was like, you know, 4.30 in the morning. And I was like, well, I've got some time. I may as well read something. So I pull out my yeah. Kobo and I was like, what will make me happy right now? What's something that like will just be easy to read and will make me feel good? And yeah. what I ended up choosing was this book, obviously. And so I started reading it at the airport while we were waiting for our plane. And I nearly cried at the airport while That's starting awesome. this book because I didn't, I wasn't That's expecting. Awesome. <laughs> so I, I know you've talked about this book a lot, so like I won't get too into it, but there is a, a scene early on in the book. Well, not a scene, I guess, but there's a part when she's talking about how she like wants to help them because they have like no yeah. food and stuff. And so she sends them a ham <laughs> yes. and they send a letter back, like talking about how thankful they are for the ham. And yeah. I just, I knew, I was like so close to tears hearing them talk about the ham because it really meant so much to them. I, don't, like, I think about I that ham. I wasn't expecting the ham to be so emotional, but it yeah. really was because like that ham changed things for them. Like that yeah. really was game changing. And so that was like, it was just so beautiful. And then I spent like, because I had two flights to get to you. So the flight right. from BC to Calgary was like a one hour flight and I finished the book on that flight. So yeah. that just goes to show like this, I didn't realize quite how small this book is, but it mm. really is tiny. It's under a hundred pages long. And since they're letters, like obviously there's a they're lot of- They're pretty short letters, They're yeah. pretty short. So I was able to read it in like, you know, under two hours. So if anybody needs a quick book to, uh, to bulk up yeah. their reading, I highly recommend this because it is like very wholesome and sweet and like makes you feel good and will maybe bring a little tear to your eye. So I'm really glad I finally read it. And um, yeah, thank you so much for, for talking about it so much because now <laughs> I, I can so officially endorse it as well as a huge Books Unbound success. 
liked it. <laughs> I loved it. <laughs> I'm so glad that you liked it because I love that book and I wasn't sure if it would be of your, like if you would like it. Because there's a lots of books that we love that the totally. other one doesn't but like. Yeah, I so guess I the, another sure. thing I can say that I liked about it is like, it is really so bookish and like yes. it took yes. me back to my bookstore days, but I like would work, I worked in a totally different like scenario than this. Like I, I love just thinking of this strange little bookstore where they're hunting for like weird books because all the books that she wanted were yeah. like really strange like essays and like you know yeah. philosophy or whatever like she was looking for strange books and they would be like oh we found this beautiful edition with gold embossed whatever and yeah. so it was really fun to just hear like those conversations and just like imagine all of the beautiful antique books and stuff so yeah. it really like transported me to the time and place which was really cool so that makes me want to read the that. sequel because mm -hmm. she wrote a sequel to it where she goes to the bookshop and stuff right and it's also very short i should read that. you should read that really short that's good <laughs> that is what i need <laughs> speaking of really short the next book that i read was jonathan livingston siegel by richard bach Richard Bach is a former USAF pilot, barnstormer, and airplane mechanic. He published over 15 books, and Jonathan Livingston Siegel spent two years on the New York Times bestseller list. Russell Munson began photographing airplanes as a young boy in Denver, Colorado. Photography and flying have been his passions ever since. He is the author and photographer of the book Skyward Why Flyers Fly. This book... So seemingly a very random choice for me. <laughs> a little tale here is simply that I was in England. I was in Bath a couple of weeks ago with my friends and we were in this pub that had like a library room and you could buy the books there for a donation. And so we were just looking at all the books kind of like, is there going to be anything in here? They're all used yeah. copies of stuff. And there's a copy of Jonathan Lewis and Siegel. And I was like, oh, that's such a great book. Like that throws me back. I haven't read that or thought about that in a really long time. Mm -hmm. And my friend Claire hadn't ever heard of it. And so she ended up getting it. Yeah. And I was like, you know, that makes me want to reread that. <laughs> like I haven't reread that in a long time. And so I came home and I picked it up. Awesome. Um, this was originally published in 1970. Oh, wow. And boy, does it feel like it. Like, <laughs> upon this reread, it's such a 1970s book because it's very preoccupied with, like, mysticism and spirituality mm. in a way that's just, like, the West discovering spirituality, um, which is really interesting. This is a great book. It is very... Like, I, I can already imagine lots of people reading it and not liking it. So, that's okay. I like it. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> fine. But basically, it's about the seagull. Jonathan Livingston, mm. who um, loves to fly. And he grows up in basically like a very puritanical group of seagulls who are all like, the reason for flying is to get food. Mm. So like eat so that you live longer. Yeah. And he's always like, I don't care that much about this way of living. I want to see like, what happens if we push our wings to the limit, <laughs> right? And so on the one hand, you can really see the author here who was a pilot yeah. and is like obsessed with flying and like wishes he was a bird kind of a thing where you're just like, this is really like a beautiful a perspective for this author to write from. Um, but he just like the, the character, the, the bird, he just like pushes himself. Yeah. He's like, if I fly higher than we've ever flown before, what will happen? Mm. If I dive faster than anyone, like, and he's just like pushing his little body to the limit to see what can a seagull do. Yeah. And he's like, wait a minute, we can do things that like we thought only hawks could do, mm. but it's because we're just so obsessed with eating. All we do is eat <laughs> and like hang out together in a flock and like do the same thing over and over again. And basically he gets shunned away from his group and the reason that it's kind of like a spiritual mystical book is because in the second act kind of thing, um, he ends up going to like a heaven type Whoa. place. And it's like, it, it, it takes on a weird little edge there. <laughs> I like it for what it is. Like it just is a strange little book, mm -hmm. but this for written by a, a pilot who seems to have been really into spirituality. It's like, okay, that's weird, <laughs> but it's a thing. And listen, like for two years, it it was on the New York Times bestseller. Oh, like wow. this book really resonated with people, right? Mm -hmm. So like clearly there's a reason that people love this book. And I'm like, why did so many people connect to this? Why did this book send, sell millions of copies? And I'm like, I think it's because it's about a person, oh, a seagull, who wants to be free. 
and like yeah. wants to be able to spend their time doing the things that they care about outside of what is societally normal mm -hmm. and okay. And I can imagine why that would have really rung true in the 70s and why I think it continues to ring true. So it's a really cool book. It's a very strange little story. It's very short. And I, um, in the info bit, also talked about the photographer because a huge part of this book is the photographs. Like every yeah. few pages, there's like a lot of photographs of seagulls and they're stunning photographs and they work so beautifully with the book. Mm -hmm. Like it's just such a great duo. I love that this, I don't, this book would not be the same without those photographs. Totally. So love it. Yeah, I've actually great. Seen, I've seen like smaller versions of that book, and now I'm wondering yeah. if that one does that one have the illustrate like the photographs as well? Like, do you know? It does. Okay, that's yeah. Good. She got the little one, and she flipped through it, oh, and nice. she had the photographs, and I was like, oh, okay, good, because okay. I also didn't know if that was like for the special edition or. What. Yeah, I've never I mean, really I think it has that. it in all of them. Yeah. Damn. That's awesome. Good stuff. Well, the book that I read next is also hmm. about animals, <laughs> so Ooh. that's fun. Um, and that book is Kick the Latch by Catherine Scanlon. In preparation for writing Kick the Latch, Scanlon interviewed real-life horse trainer Sonia, whom the main character is named after. Using these transcribed interviews, Scanlon has crafted a taut, fast-paced novel full of gripping vignettes about the world of horse racing, spanning many decades in under 150 pages. This is a book that I got from the book truck. Hello. I am... I know, that's so exciting. <laughs> that, that also is pretty... I mean, just like the book I gave you, or you gave me, you just got that. Just that's got new. it just got it um yeah so it felt i actually started reading it like pretty much right after i got home i was like i want to read this book so bad um and so i did and like you you can see it's kind of, i mean i'll show ariel here it's lots of like little tiny vignettes yeah. like lots of really small chapters each chapter is like one to two pages long so it makes for a really quick read as well um but yeah this book was interesting and like it reads very quickly as well because like you'll one second be reading a, like one page where she's just like okay so like this is how I got into horse racing and then the next page she'll be like oh and then this here's like something that happened to me when I was a kid and then she'll like just jump to the next thing so it kind of jumps around a lot in a way that oh, yeah. I liked like it was good it didn't feel like hectic or crazy it just felt like the way a person would tell their life story you know it's kind of like okay so this happened to me and then oh yeah and then this thing happened and mm. it was like weirdly funny at times and then the next page sometimes it would just be like something devastating and then she would just move okay. on and um in I, I can't remember if it was i saw this somewhere like on maybe on wikipedia or something when i was researching the author but she says that she like wanted to really like hold on to the voice of Sonia, who is like this real life person that she interviewed. And then this is a novel. Mm. It's like a novelized version of her story, but she really wanted to like keep her voice. And because the way she talks, I guess, is just this very blunt, like straightforward, very matter of fact. And I feel like she did a really good job with that because the character feels so like, feels like a real person. And it's okay. a very cool story too, because like the sense of time is kind of like, ambiguous like you don't know what year it is but like at the beginning of the story she's like so I'm 18 and then like all of a sudden you'll be halfway through the book and she's like I'm about to turn 40 like she'll just like drop little hints throughout and so you realize that this really is like covering a, like a huge span of time and like it was just really cool well like it was a weird little book and I haven't read anything mm. like it and I also it's one of those cases where after I finished it I was like I kind of want to read this over again right now because like I want to pick up on all this, the things that I missed the first time around and stuff Whoa. so I yeah I really really liked it and I do highly recommend it it's very like hard to explain but it's like a cool yeah. little like fast little like gunshot of a book almost whoa. like it just feels like whoa and um it does have lots of interesting insights about what it's like to be a horse trainer as well and like what like what a hard life it is to kind of be like on the track all the time like for decades like this person is and so it kind of like just yeah it was like an interesting little glimpse into a world i don't know much about um did the cool. short chapters like was that fun? Do you like that? I liked or did it you a lot. Feel like I really liked annoying? it. Okay, cool. yeah, and it made it really easy to like dip in and out of. Or I'd be like, oh, I'll just mm. like read a couple of these little little vignettes, and um, yeah, it was cool. It was really cool. I liked it. a That's lot. That's so neat. I'm glad that that worked out because you were excited about that yeah, on the truck. Yeah, me too. That's awesome. 
All right, the next thing that I read was Q&A by Adrian Tomine. Adrian Tomine was born in 1974 in Sacramento, California. He began self-publishing his comic book series, Optic Nerve, when he was 16. And in 1994, he received an offer to publish from Drawn and Quarterly. Since 1999, Tomine has been a regular contributor to The New Yorker. He lives in Brooklyn with his wife and daughters, and this book was published in October 2024. I just bought this. I was going to say, that's brand new. No wonder I haven't heard of it. <laughs> yeah. I didn't even realize when I saw it in the shop that it was so recent. I think I I think I did used to know that, and I forgot. <laughs> but anyways, I saw it in the shop, and I was like, yes, I'm buying that. I loved it. It was great. This was awesome. So this continues my like fascination, ongoing fascination with reading books about writing. Like I oh, love yeah. books about writing. I've read a lot of them. Um, you know, the top two that I talk about are On Writing by Stephen King and What I Talk About When I Talk About Writing by Haruki Murakami. But there's lots of great books about writing by writers. Mm -hmm. It's just, I just love that genre. I mean, it's very similar to uh, books about bookstores. Like, it's yeah. nice to read about this nerdy thing that I'm so fascinated by. Um, and this was really cool because it was the first book of that genre that I've read from a graphic novelist. Ooh, okay. um, well, he I, he calls himself a comic, comic artist, I guess, <laughs> comics artist. But yeah, it's, I have, I feel like I learned a lot about his life because I obviously just read his memoir a couple of mm -hmm. weeks ago and I really learned a lot about his specific life in that book. But in this book, he formats it very simply as a question and answer. So oh, cool. him and his publisher, I don't know exactly through what channel, but they asked for questions. And then he literally just spent a bunch of time and answered them to the best of his ability. Yeah. And they published it in this book. Um, it's very, it's a lovely little book. It's nice and small, which is cute. Like it's small, like it's short. Um, it's like a hundred and I think it was, yeah, 160 pages. Um, and it's cool because there's photographs. So in one section of the book, he talks about like the equipment that he uses, the mm. tools and supplies. Oh, that's cool. And there's a beautiful photograph of each supply that he talks about and he talks about why he likes it. But then there's also sections where, you know, he's talking about, people will ask him, how do you work on dialogue? And so he'll put a comic strip from his other works and he'll be like, this is a, uh, comic that I did for this and you can tell I, I did this and so there's um, an opportunity to publish the actual little strips cool. um, and then there's also like a huge part of his job is that he does a lot of covers for the New Yorker which is extremely cool and there's a really neat breakdown of how he builds those covers and so there's like the original sketch in here oh, and yeah. then it builds on like then I work on the lighting and then it like then I just do the pencil drawing and then the inking and then uh, the coloration and that's the final New Yorker cover. And you're like, wow, I didn't think about how much goes into this right. one cover for this magazine. And he has to do it really quickly because they publish every week or every two weeks or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so cool. yeah, it was so cool. So I really like Adrian Tomine and I really like his writing style. It did remind me a little bit of that book that I read. Um, uh, like the t-shirt book from her oh. or or his other stuff where it's just like it's a very quick short book and it's very casual like that's the thing about um Herky Murakami's nonfiction is that it's he's so casual there's like very little formality at all and yeah. he's just like hey buddy here's what I'm thinking <laughs> I love that. like there was a little bit of that with this one as well where it's just very straightforward and just like it could almost be blogs or right. like yeah you, you this could be like on Instagram like just responding to questions <laughs> on Instagram. Like it could be, it's very, very basic. Yeah. Um, like in the, in the form, but that's why it's nice to read. Cause it just feels like an author truly just talking to you yeah. and answering questions. It's a nice switch up from like a very formal kind of yeah. book. Yeah, that's awesome. totally. So I really enjoyed this one. It was cool. Well, my last book is also weirdly about animals a little bit. So <laughs> I'm just gonna tell you what it is. And that Ooh. is Cursed Bunny by Bora Chung, which is translated by Anton Hurt. Bora Chung was born in Seoul, South Korea in 1976. She completed graduate studies in Russian and Eastern European studies at Yale University, then went on to earn a PhD in Slavic literature from Indiana University, Bloomington. She has written three novels and three collections of short stories, two of which have now been translated into English. This is another kind of mashed potato book. I've been totally. really wanting to read this for quite a yeah. long time. And a long time. I, I really wanted to read it this 
spooky season because I wanted to read it last year in like October and I didn't get around to it. And so I was like, I have to, I have to follow what I want. And apparently, as you can see from the stack, it was not following my 24 and 24 TBR. I just kind of like went oh, off the rails, okay. which is fine. I had a good time. Yeah. Um, so with this one, it was a little all over the place for me, to be honest. Okay. I really liked a few of the stories and some of Classic. them I really didn't like. And Classic. so rather than being like a middle of the road kind of book, it was like leaning more towards I didn't like it, which really sucked. But yeah. the few that I liked, I did really like. So the first couple of stories were... They kind of made me think of like Otessa Moshfeg and Sayaka Murata Ooh, okay. a little bit, like kind of gross yeah. and like, ooh, what? Like the first story <laughs> is about toilet stuff. <laughs> like it's like, ooh, oh, it's okay. like proper yep. gross, you know? And but yeah. very interesting. Like they're the first couple of stories and then one or two um sort of spread out were like kind of unsound women vibes, like weird things happening to to women. And so those were my favorite ones. Like I really like that type yeah. of story. But there were also a lot that were like fairy tale-esque and I really okay. didn't like any of those ones, unfortunately. Uh. Like I really wasn't into those. Although there was one really interesting story that was about this like man who's really poor, who finds this fox that he finds out, that he finds the fox in a trap. And so the fox is bleeding and injured and the blood is gold. And so he's mm, like, oh, okay. heck yeah, I can like, I can turn this into money. And so he like keeps the fox as a hostage and like is using its its gold blood to like make money. So like that one was really interesting and like where the story went was really cool. So that was the only one that was kind of like fairy tale esque that I was like, oh, that, I like that. Um, mm. But there was also one story that I wasn't into that was like half the book. Like it was so long and yeah. I couldn't believe it. It had chapter <laughs> breakdowns and it had like 30 oh. like i was like why am i on oh. chapter 23 right now this is so wow. weird so there was just some things about it that i'm like i don't know yeah. i just didn't really understand like what th there was no through line for those uh. stories you know like they didn't feel like they all went together i feel yeah. like if you had just been reading the stories independently maybe it would make a little bit more sense but they just they felt disconnected a lot of them felt really empty like i didn't really feel like connected to any of the characters for the most part and it was kind of like what's the point why are we all here? Um, so all in all, it, yeah, it just felt kind of like empty to me is the, the way that I, I really feel about it. Um, so I can't really say I recommend it, unfortunately. I am, Damn. I am curious enough to read more of her books though. Like I'm definitely okay. not totally off of the author because I did really like some of the stories. So I know that there's something in there. It's just a matter of finding the right thing. So I think her, her other book that's out your utopia i think that one is also stories i would love to read a novel by her really i don't know if she has a novel that's been translated translated yet maybe you can tell me oh let's see i'm seeing three things grocery list oh i don't know that one that just came out in 2024 ghost story whoa ghost is it one story or is it many stories <laughs> Uh, oh my god, it's tiny. It's the tiniest book I ever saw. What? Like it's like it's like three inches tall. What the heck? <laughs> oh my god. So maybe it's just one short story. It's eighty pages long. Oh okay, yeah, that sounds like there's a um, Hiromi Kawakami book like that. Just a little guy. Okay, okay, okay. So that doesn't really It says on her Goodreads, it says has written three novels and three collections of short stories, but I think that none of the novels have been translated. Okay, that's what that's what I was worried about. I think her short stories yeah. are coming over here first. It's okay, just fine. Yeah. Maybe we'll get the novels eventually. Yeah, I just have to wait. Just have to wait. Hope that Anton Her has some more time. <laughs> <laughs> he does seem like a very busy man. Yeah, he's translating a lot. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, the last thing that I read was kind of funny that you were talking about fairy tales mm. because I read a fairy tale-y thing. And it is Beauty mm. by Carasette and Hubert. Carascote is the joint pen name of the French illustrators, uh, Marie Pompuy and Sebastian Cassette, who are married and met in art school. And Hubert is an author that worked on this project. That is maybe the worst info bit I've ever done. Apologies to everyone. <laughs> I couldn't find any information about these folks and when i did it was all in french and mm. when i would translate it like i literally was like on google translate trying to translate things like it just was not translating well it was a mess it was a mess um but this was also translated from the french um and and it, again i couldn't find the translator like there is not oh uh, they're not on the cover That's they're funny. nowhere um but it, it says it in here translation by joe johnson okay all right 
that aside, <laughs> that little mess aside here. This was one of the graphic novels that I bought a couple of, well, maybe now it was months ago when I bought a bunch of graphic novels and I read almost all of them. Now I've read all of the ones I bought, which is fun. Um, this was great. <gasps> It's really good. Amazing. And I recommend it. And what's funny, I didn't realize this. When I was looking up and like, trying to figure out who this illustrator is, and it's, again, it's complicated because it's not a real name. Like, it's like this joint oh, pen yeah. name for these two other people. And then I couldn't find information about the. Anyways, <clears throat> they illustrated that book that you gave me years ago called Beautiful Darkness. I thought that's what you were going to say. Yeah, they illustrated that. And I didn't really end up liking that book. But I love their work in this book a lot. Oh, that's great. Like, the colors are crazy. They're kind of like sour neon. Mm. They're very intense. It's very, very beautiful. And the illustration, yeah, I really love the illustration. I also really like the story because it was very, like, it was like a saga. Like, <laughs> like it was like a whole history. It was, it was a whole journey. This story really packed in a lot. And I was talking a couple months ago on the podcast where I feel like I keep reading graphic novels and they don't pack in enough right. story yeah. or enough character development. And I felt like this was the opposite. Like I felt like there was so much story nice. and it was really fun and exciting. And basically the tale is about a woman named Beauty who is very ugly. And she starts the story and she's like, um, like a peasant woman in a fairy tale-esque vibe. She is like hated by everyone in her community. Everyone treats her terribly. She goes to cry in a in a forest and she accidentally cries on top of a fairy mm. and like breaks a fairy spell. Oh my gosh. And you know, classic tear on 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 a fairy situation. <laughs> classic. And she uh gets a wish. And so she wishes that she was beautiful. Mm. But like the it turns out that this fairy is kind of actually evil. And she kind of curses her with too much beauty. Uh oh. And basically everyone, every man that sees her try, like loses his mind. Like he cannot stop thinking about her. And like basically wars start to be ra like raged over this woman. Yeah. And so it's this huge epic. I honestly, it was a like Game of Thrones level. <laughs> like literally there was like different factions and there was different kingdoms and, and it was all very easy to follow. It never got complicated, but it was like epic. Like, like she would marry a man and then they would, he would be killed because of, of this whole thing and she'd have to marry another man so there was eras and epics and Whoa. she has a daughter and it, it took me on such a journey I really <laughs> enjoyed it overall I, I did give it like it's more like a 4 4.5 star situation but you really liked it just because I felt like the ending was like slightly anticlimactic mm. and just I was like I felt like we were building to more of a moral at the end of it like I think with fairy tales you really yeah. are like, you feel like there's supposed to be this big moral at the end of it. And I felt a little bit like it undercut itself a slight okay. bit, but I still like super recommend it. And if you're into graphic novels, I have not read a graphic novel like this before. It was really one of a, one of a kind. Also, apparently it was comics and this is the bind up oh, of cool. the three comics that came out. So this is all, this is the whole story in one. Um, yeah, I really liked it. And there was just a lot of cool characters and I'm kind of sad. I was kind of sad when I finished it because I was like, oh, I really had fun in that world. Damn, I'm glad you finally read a graphic novel that you really love. I know, me too. It feels like it's been a while, but I really did enjoy that one. Amazing. Um, all right. You know, folks, we didn't think it would take us this long, but it did. We had a lot to review and a lot to catch you up on. So now you know what we've read. Next week, we can start to, to get back on top of telling you what we're in the middle of. Yes, although I am in the middle good. of something that I'll quickly tell you about. Ooh, okay, yeah. um, so just because I want to pat my own back, I'm doing a really good oh. job here <laughs> with my goals. Um, I'm currently reading Breasts and Eggs by Miyako Kawakami. Ah, and I am fantastic. now this far into it. I've, I'm in the last little chunk here. I have been listening to it on audiobook actually and crocheting. So nice. next week I will review this book and I'll show you my finished crochet project probably because I'm almost Ooh. done. So it's all very exciting, but yes. I'm happy to be reading a book off of my specific TBR, so. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. No, I'm glad that you told us so we can await further instruction. That was a book that I started last year. Yeah, I remember that. I wonder how much I have left. Maybe I should race it's to pretty, finish it. It's a pretty long book. It. It On, really well, the audio book is like 15 hours long or something. Like it's a, a that's bit scary chunky. stuff. But yeah, that try and catch up. Stuff. That'd be funny. I don't think it's going to A little retroactive actually. buddy read. <laughs> 
<laughs> All right. Thank you so much to everyone for listening and hanging out with us on this episode. We are going to go record our Patreon only mini podcast, The Question Vase, where we answer some fun questions from our patrons. We do mini episodes every single week, so you can keep listening to us if you, that's what you really want. <laughs> um, yeah. So thank you so much, and we'll talk to you all next week. Bye. Bye.